speak louder. Uh, so um, I thought I'd just let you know that Scott's image here has been generated by artificial intelligence, because you can see how much younger he looks in the picture <laughs> than he is in person. Um, Scott has a long and distinguished career in many academic communities. Um, he teaches at uh, now. He is the uh, Fred Stevenson Professor, Stevenson Bernard Professor um, at uh, uh, a rival school here, uh, George uh, Washington, but we like him anyway. And he was a commissioner at the, at the ITC and uh, has his own consulting firm too, um, where he helps clients navigate the thickets of IP, including patent thickets. Professor. Uh, this is joint work with my colleague, uh, Tom Grant, uh, we've been collaborating on, on quite a bit, and uh, we have a new initiative we put together uh, that brings together folks from Cambridge and Yale and GW to look at a range of trade and IP and security issues, and we, we focus ourselves in the Foggy Bottom campus, but uh, we're, we're trying to um, uh, convene conversations. We welcome input. All of the information we're providing here should be available from the conference and then also uh, from our materials as well. So, you know, when you think about patent thickets and you think about the debates about patents, one of the things we like to remind people is um, you can make a very sympathetic case for an innocent infringer, um, a Native American who, uh, who reaches into the ground that her ancestors owned, who assembles stuff that she pulls out of the ground. Notice I'm, we call this hand waving. Uh, I'm picking your pocket, by the way, because if you're a patent lawyer, none of that matters. What matters is the claim and is there infringement. And while I have really good title to the stuff I use to infringe, more hand-waving doesn't matter. I, I'm indigenous, doesn't matter. I didn't know about the patent, doesn't matter. I didn't mean it, doesn't matter. I'm a good faith purchaser for value. Um, I don't think you're a good faith purchaser for value of the infringement because www.uspto.gov puts us all on notice of property rights, which prevents good faith reliance. That's why we have recording acts. So a lot of red herrings, a lot of debates. I think it's not helping the conversation. We rely heavily on these three folks. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Here's a good south sider. Um, I work for Judge Rich. I love the guy. There he is. Uh, he used to keep in chambers a photo of Learned Han peering over the bench because he argued and lost his first case before Judge Han when Han was a district judge. Um, but what did, what did these three thinkers about patents have in common? That not, not politics, three very different flavors of political ice cream in our spectrum here in America. One's a Republican, two Democrats, one's a progressive Democrat, one's a centrist Democrat, but they all had a property rights approach to patents. Jefferson says, you know, why, why with IP? I mean, if, if I take your light, how do I make you dark? Gosh, I, I think this is, this is the 1-800-infringe.com. This is the public get out the vote act for everyone in the non-IP community. But, you know, why are you blowing out the other guy's candle? Because that's what's happened in our IP debates. Uh, kids have a different expression for this. This is don't yuck on my yum, right? Like, what, what, hey, I, I got my IP going here. I got my yum, I'm doing my thing. Why do you have to destroy validity and enforceability just to get your gig on? Kids, uh, there's, there's a great book. Um, uh, the Mysterious Benedict Society, adults, you might prefer Julie Louis Dreyfus and the, 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 the brand new AA um, uh, car, the 
Mercedes AA class. What do these have in common? What do they invent here? Glastanium. How did they invent it? Well, you know, it sounds cool. It's clear as glass, strong as titanium. Uh, she's, her, her employer in this made up advertisement has invented the electric vehicle. Go watch the video, it's really fun. You'll notice how many batteries they have to dump out of the car every few seconds just to get it to go anywhere. If you ask people about the inventive community, it's really not about coming up with a cool name, Glastanium, or a cool idea. It would be great if cars like use no energy. Uh, great ideas, but that's so abstract and so silly. And you get in these debates around silliness, you're drinking silly sauce. You're just chasing each other around a circle. Uh, this is a relatively recent photo, 2019, some of this has changed since COVID, of a street corner with three different places you can go and sit with a laptop and maybe have a bite to eat and maybe get some Wi-Fi and maybe some coffee. Three very different payment schemes. A Starbucks, a restaurant, and a place where you rent space to work and they give you free food. But they're just different ways of bundling. You get these debates about like what is the true historical measure of the value of, of, of you or whatever you just did. And then the answer is there's no evidence because, well, remember in every infringement case, we know why there wasn't a market value because the infringer chose to infringe rather than engage in a market transaction. So this is a search for fiction. You won't find evidence of this. In these debates about property rights, when you try to think about thickets, it's often discussed as though more property rights are bad. And I don't want to make the case that more property rights are good. I want to make the case that that's the wrong question to ask. It's not about whether you have more or fewer property rights. It's about how you structure the details. And when you structure the details one way, diverse, human, and business actors in society have an incentive to interact with the, each other. And when you structure them differently, they have all an incentive to only interact with the government. That's a very different game. So when we talk about the mechanism behind patents, the idea that Isabel, the inventor, is going to invent more if she's like a rabbit given a carrot of a patent, that's not what this is about. This is about beacons in the dark drawing people together around something to transact with each other, to coordinate with each other. And of course, there are really straightforward reasons why in the political economy of today's debates, firms of particular sizes have very different strategies to how they spend their money in DC or Brussels or elsewhere on patents. Now, Again, all of these are available for deeper depth if folks would like later. There's a lot of rhetoric about how pat, pat, you're going to, you, I'm already dead because of patents. We're all dying because patents kill people. But, but we hate rhetoric. This, this is out of the same mouth. This is the same person speaking. These are actual quotes. You know, it's interesting when you look at a market of academics sharing data in biology. Blumenthal and his team at Harvard did these long studies, longitudinal studies of data sharing among scientists and tried to figure out like why do scientists break down in their transactions over sharing data in biology. And they asked every question and they asked everyone and they did it for many years. Turns out patents either don't show up in the data at all, or they're a positive factor. They lubricate the transactions. You know what shows up a lot in the data? All the same ugly things that shows up through the rest of society. People who are snobs don't share. People who are racist don't share. People who are misogynistic don't share. All of that stuff shows up in the data. That shows up big time in the data. And so Lisa Koch, who used to study IP as well as finance, she's now at the Federal Reserve Board, she has long done work on talking about how race and gender are big 
impact factors in why you get breakdowns in markets. And it's no accident that this year's Nobel Prize happens to be a patent for a technology that a woman trained outside of the US entering the US academic market found, well, let's just say it was a clumsy market, right? You go read the stories in the Wall Street Journal about what her university did to her for almost her entire career until after she went into the private market to transact and then acquired a Nobel Prize well, we all know what happens to kids who do well. They got lots of parents. Everyone's their parent. Pens, oh, they're so proud of their darling. No, they kicked her to the curb for years. I think mistakes. the point of this is that markets are thicketed or thick uh, in different ways. Those are purposefully distracting terms. What economists think of as a thick market is a market that has a diverse set of participants and a diverse set of assets. And that's why the life sciences market empirically evolved around patents with a big increase in output and a big increase in diversity of firm size. So the data shows that thickening the market makes it better for all of us if by better we mean we like more drugs for us at fewer prices, lower prices, we like more inclusive. Hey, if you like a sexist, racist, closed off, expensive system, get rid of patents and call that a thicket. That's the answer. So I'll just wrap up by saying we think this plays out in a lot of ways in the modern world. We're happy to talk about that. We're happy to talk about how you see the flipping around politics and how even in a setting where this is a great example of politics on this issue. This is a guy standing at the podium in the White House with the presidential seal with the president next to him and this was a president who didn't like sharing almost anything. So this guy's got that kind of access, and six months later, he loses one of the easiest, syphious cases on the face of the planet to win. So you really have to be careful with today's political game. And we can talk about how this plays out in the high-tech space with a whole set of arguments that were absolutely schadenfreude verboten, never except always. So. If you like Star Trek, Captain Kirk, he goes back with his crew. He has no idea how taxi cabs work and streets. He runs into a cab. The cabbie yells at him, hey, double, hey, dummy. He uses another term, dummy. And what does Kirk do? Kirk has learned how we in Washington speak to each other today. His response to dummy is, well, double dummy back on you. So the double dummy back on you argument is the way we argue this stuff, but we can structure our government differently where you provide incentives for the litigants to make more moderate, modulated, middle of the road arguments because they have selfish reasons to do that and the adjudicators to do the same thing in their adjudications. So we would recommend that. Now for the students in the room, I'll just point out, we care a lot about getting jobs for you, we have a free set of videos and slides about how to do a job search. So we would offer that if you would like, and we're available to talk more if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so yeah, the common narrative, uh, or the growing narrative, I should say, about um, biopharmaceuticals, both biologics and small molecule drugs, is that they have a huge number of patents on their various products, um, and that this huge number of patents is designed solely to keep follow-ons, either biosimilars or generic um, small molecule drugs, from entering the market. So we want to take a closer look at this and say, well, first of all, really, what is a thicket? So um, when I first thought about thickets, when I first heard about thickets, I heard about them with regard to um, basically complementary technologies, right? That in order to make a single cell phone, you needed to coordinate so many different patent rights 
um, amongst so many different patent holders that the transaction costs were often insurmountable, uh, and therefore you couldn't make a single marketable product without being able to coordinate all these um, patents. So it's kind of like having a puzzle, wanting to put it together, but you're missing some of the pieces, right? Um, you could argue that a patent thicket could come from something like a foundational technology, right? So if you've got a patent on some sort of foundational technology and that foundational technology is necessary in order to build additional technologies, you could say, okay, um, the patent on the foundational technology actually prohibits others from being able to develop those later um, uh, technologies. And again, here, the, the question isn't even really about the number of patents, but rather about the positioning and the scope of the patent. Or, and I think this is actually what much more accurately characterizes at least what we see in small molecule drugs, you could have a large number of patents, um, but the single patent that really is the most important is going to be the patent on the active ingredient, the original compound, right? And once that patent expires, and it typically is the first to, uh, patent to expire in that particular family, generics now can copy that active ingredient and enter the market. Sure, there are going to be a lot of other secondary patents, uh, on the drug products, but there aren't going to be secondary patents on the drug substance, right? And so the secondary patents really are cumulative, but they're not necessarily complementary. They are not patents to which you need to have access in order to market the underlying drug product. Um, and so um, part of what I want to push back on is this idea that um, we have a large number of patents Necessarily, we have a patent thicket. It's a really nice sound bite, but does it actually do what we think patent thickets do? Does it really raise the same concerns about patent thickets that are raised in other technologies? And I think the ultimate definition of a patent thicket, to answer Judge Braden's question, has to be that the number of patents somehow actually stops others from being able to do what they, they're going to do, whether that's to create a uh, new innovation, a further innovation, or simply to copy an existing innovation on which the patent has expired. And so unless you can actually connect those dots for me, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that we actually see patent thickets uh, in small molecule drugs. So for example, um, with small molecule drugs, anyway, um, it's definitely not about su uh, subsequent innovation, right? It's not about being able to create your own variation on a small molecule drug. Rather, it's about um, kind of abject copying um, and, in fact, required copying in order to be approved as a generic and to go on the market. Um, and so uh, even though we clearly have seen an increase in the number of patents on small molecule drugs, mostly uh, these uh, what are called secondary patents or sequential patents, right? Um, I would argue that those uh, secondary patents are not so much about um, trying to block others from uh, entering the market, but rather trying to leverage the original drug substance uh, and trying to um, continue to innovate on that drug substance in a way that are now protected by patents, but before the Hatch-Waxman Act was actually protected by uh, trade secrecy and ex exclusivity over um, uh, clinical trials data. A related issue, too, then, is why do we object so much to secondary patents on small molecule drugs. Um, I think I was talking with um, one of my panelists or someone else um, yesterday about this, where we like innovation, we like further innovation in other technologies, but apparently we don't like it when it comes to small molecule drugs or even biologics, um, but that's a, that's a slightly different question. Um, and so we have um, uh, no real change in effective patent life, or no real change in effective exclusivity, uh, uh, as my, my co-panelist Hans reminds me, despite the fact that we've had this, this growth in secondary patents, which again suggests that these secondary patents are not creating thickets. At least if you define a thicket as the use of patents to keep others from entering the market. Um, and so, uh, again, no real change pre-Hatch-Waxman, post-Hatch-Waxman, despite the fact that we have a far greater number of patents per drug substance now than we did prior to Hatch-Waxman. The other thing I want to address um, is this allegation, um, specifically with regard to small molecule drugs, 
that um, not only are they creating patent thickets through secondary patents, um, but that they're also uh, creating thickets through continuation practice. Uh, and so um, I think this was part of the reading for this, um, uh, available reading for this particular panel. Um, but Professor Sean too has, has done a fair amount of, of empirical research on continuations practice in small molecule drugs. And his conclusion from this, and he calls this the long con, right, is that small molecule drug producers um, accumulate these uh, patent thickets through continuation practice um, uh, and are able to create these thickets purely by virtue of the sheer number of patents that they eventually accumulate on a particular small molecule drug. Um, but if you look at what's actually going on, right, with these continuations, it may look like there are a large number of patents, but you could also argue that because of uh, terminal disclaimers um, for obviousness type double patenting, um, which I don't know is actually happening all that much in small molecule drugs, but particularly with continuations, right? Continuations are going to expire on the same day as their original right. parent or grandparent, Right? And so what you've done is basically the equivalent of adding claims to the original parent or grandparent patent. Uh, and again, it, unless you can show, unless you can connect the dots, that adding those claims, or in the case of continuation patents, adding subsequent patents that still expire at the same time, unless you can show and connect the dots that the, uh, the acquisition of these additional patents or patent claims actually keeps others out of the market, including generics, right, who are just, you know, uh, have to copy abjectly, um, then I don't know that there is necessarily uh, a thicket going on here. Um, you could argue, I suppose, that um, by use of continuations and by the fact that the continuations um, appear after the original uh, grandparent or parent um, application is published, that there might be some issues of notice with regard to claim structure or to claim uh, the patent claims. Um, but you still have the same, same specification, right? And so generics or others um, still have the same notice because you've got the same specification by, by necessity in terms of a continuation. And so I don't know that it even cre creates any kind of submarine situation. Um, or la other lack of notice that would actually prevent others from being able to enter the market with some degree of confidence. Um, and so the one uh, other thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, okay, perhaps there are no patent thickets in small molecule drugs, right? Um, but we have now a new class of pharmaceuticals that's much more complex, um, and this is the biologics. And we know that with biologics, um, there are many more patents. And I think both um, Kevin and Hans are going to talk about biologics in more detail, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but even then, we have to question whether or not they're actual patent thickets. And again, defining a thicket as some number of patents that serve solely to keep others out of the market. Um, and in fact, when the BPCIA was enacted, there was some debate about whether it was even relevant because the BPCIA mostly focuses on patents and we've got the whole patent dance. But the question was, well, are patents on biologics really going to be that useful? Do they actually um, provide that much exclusivity? Because the BPCIA also established biosimilars, which means you don't have to have abject copying. You don't have to copy. Um, you can, in fact, create your own biologic, something more similar to a Me Too, which itself could be separately patentable. And so uh, the fact that you no longer require identity also means that the, the effect of your patents may be much less um, than it would be had you uh, required um, uh, bioidentity the way we do with gen generics. So I'm not sure uh, that we have patent thickets even in biologics. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to address is um, uh, some other authors, um, and, and um, in particular Bernard Chow, Professor Bernard Chow is a friend of mine, um, have made the argument, well, okay, you want us to connect the dots, right? You want us to show that this increase in the number of patents um, directly correlates with uh, delayed entry by either um, biosimilars or generics. 
okay, well, one of the ways that we can do this is compare when a biosimilar enters the market in the United States versus when it enters the market uh, in the EU or Canada or other jurisdictions. So in this particular study, they looked at the EU and Canada. And they said, well, we see biosimilars entering the market earlier in Canada, earlier in the EU than we do in the United States, and that we see more patents on the biologics in the United States. Uh, ergo, uh, the higher number of patents in the United States must be the factor that's causing the later entry of biosimilars in the United States. And again, I think this is, this is a tempting conclusion to draw. But you also have to look at all the other differences between the United States and Canada and the EU. Um, and we know that there are um, uh, slight differences in patenting, the patenting requirements and patentability in the EU and the United States. I won't go into detail about those here. Um, the same with regard to Canada. But there are also very different market um, situations in the EU and in Canada than there are in the United States. We have a very different insurance system, very different regulatory system, very different market sizes, and those are all also factors for which you have to control in order to determine whether it is actually the sheer number of patents that's causing the delay in uh, uh, biosimilar market entry in the United States. So uh, in sum, um, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done before we can actually allege that there are, in fact, patent thickets. Um, and one of the, uh, and I forgot in which case it is, but there was a recent case about alleged patent thickets in biologics, um, or maybe it was small molecule drugs, um, and the judge said, no, I don't think there's a patent thicket here because if you compare this technology with um, electronics or something else where you really see huge numbers of patents, it's clear that the numbers of patents in um, biologics or small molecule drugs are much smaller and the criticism of that particular decision was, OK, but we can't just look at the numbers, right? We can't just look at the numbers. But I think that argument goes the other way around, too. You can't just look at the numbers of patents. You've actually got to show what the effect of that pat those patents are and what the effect of having additional patents actually is on the, the potential for others to be able to enter the market. And with that, I'll end there and hand it over to Kevin. While Dr. Newman is getting uh, set up, um, we put together a, a compendium of secondary resources for you in the materials and also some of the more recent cases that have discussed patent thickets, um, which I think should be helpful in your, to those of you that are practicing law. Um, I'd also uh, recommend that you take a look at some of the, there's one of the articles that's done by um, uh, Professor Mossoff here, who talks about the first patent thicket, was, which was in sewing machines. And um, there were the sewing machine wars um, back in the late um, 1800s and early 1900s. And the, the result of that was a patent pool that was put together. The same thing happened um, in a different industry, uh, looking at, um, in the airline industry, the same the same thing um, happened and it, and it resulted basically in a patent pool. So um, I don't know if that's the answer to what we, what we have right now or not. Um, I didn't introduce myself when we started, but I'm, um, I was chief of the federal, the United States Court of Appeals, excuse me, I was chief, <laughs> Pauline Newman is on my mind. I was the chief of the United States Court of Federal Claims that is a tri trial court, basically, for the Federal Circuit. And I retired, and I'm one of the things I'm doing, aside from being the, um, a uh, jurist in residence here, is I'm on the Private Patent Advisory Committee. And I will tell you that you may recall that the president has a had an executive order that asked for cooperation um, between the Federal Drug Administration and the Patent Office. And a study is going to be coming out, a report will be coming out, not this year, it appears, but probably early next. It's being um, vented right now in the, um, in the director's office in both of the um, agencies. But they don't seem to have concluded from what I've gathered that, that patent thickets are an issue in pharmaceuticals. There does seem to be a, a 
popular misconception about what a continuation patent is, that it doesn't extend the life of the patent. And a lot of, I think that may be a lot of the problem basically in, in terms of the perceptions on Capitol Hill. But at any event, we are um, honored really to have Dr. Noonan with us. Um, he is a lawyer, but more importantly that he um, has a doctorate from Princeton in microbiology, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Cancel Cancer Institute. He practices law um, with the, uh, everybody has initials now, it says the MBHB, uh, Biotechnology and Pharmaceutical Group, and uh, he's a very seasoned patent lawyer and business advisor, uh, Dr. Noonan. Thank you. The reason we do, in our case, MBHP is that uh, Dan Bainan is the second one of our partners, and nobody can pronounce Bainan properly, so it's just easier to say. <laughs> All right, this slide is actually one day out of date because Hans reminded me that there was another, there's a 44th biosimilar out there, and in the slides that are updated that you'll get, it actually says that. I think that the great thing for me, as you know, just a simple country patent lawyer, is to come to a group like this where we have really intelligent, people who think about this, and that has nothing to do with patent tickets. And the problem is, is that this is, this is a meme that's being used for a purpose. And the purpose is, I think, it comes from, especially on Capitol Hill, the fact that, that even though the FTC warned us about this in 2008, this idea was, okay, biologic drugs are gonna be cheaper, and they're gonna be cheaper quickly. Um, the FTC said in 2008 that we can expect a reduction of about 30% in the course of a biologic drug and a biosimilar. And the reason for that was, for example, they said, it costs about $5 million to get a small molecule generic to market. It costs about a quarter of a billion dollars to do that for biologic, because not only of its complexity, but the fact that most companies have to build a plant, a new way of making it, because you can't make biologic drugs the way you make you know, aspirin. And one of the consequences of their prescience in saying that is if you look at this table, um, you'll notice a lot of the biosimilar applicants are, go figure, biologic companies, Amgen, Genentech, big companies. Not the, You don't see Dr. Reddy's on here. You don't see Mylan on here. You see mostly big bi biologics companies. Why? Because they didn't have to make that investment. And the fact that there's 44 is remarkable given that the first one was 2015. But what's happened is, and we see this everywhere, drugs cost too much. Everybody's, you said, you'll never get a debate, whether it's Democrat, Republican, right, left, drugs cost too much. And how do we fix it? Well, patents are the, are the whipping boy to say why they cost too much. And of course, the biologics, uh, biosimilar hasn't fixed all of this. So you have basically what I call meme wars. And for those of us who went through the Myriad case, you know, we've been here before, where I think even uh, there's, there's a, a point of view, um, uh, Channel 11 or PBS in, in, in New York, um, program about this where Mark Skolnick got kind of ambushed by the woman who's making the film because he thought she was going to come in and say how wonderful he was and she basically said how come your test costs so much and, and so that is the issue for a lot of people and it's a very strong political issue and the problem is that I said that we're 44 there's really like 12 reference products. Maybe there's an extra one here. And the reason for that is that all of, and the reason for the patent ticket problem, is all of these drugs are greater than 14 years from their approval date by FDA. And the reason for that is that we didn't have the VPCIA until 2010. And so people, these biologic drugs were EPO and drugs like them, and Herceptin was in the 90s, EPO was in the 80s, and a lot of these drugs, these very popular and, 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 and useful drugs, they were more than 14 years. So that regulatory exclusivity that was supposed to be the thing that, that let the companies that make these drugs at great cost get return on investment, even though there's a famous study by Professor Grabowski, I think it was Grabowski, in Duke that says that the return on investment time on average should be 17 years of exclusivity. Well, the compromise was 14, although President Obama wanted to make it seven uh, for a very long time and got scolded by Representative Eshoo at the time that this is the one thing we agree on, stop trying to change it. But if you look at this, the approvals went up. You can see that they kind of went down in, during COVID, which makes some sense, but I think they're coming back again. Um, but these are all drugs that you don't get them in everything. You only get them in this small cluster. So because the drugs are off patent, what does that do? 
it provides an incentive for companies to file what are called ancillary patents protections on the methods that these, by which these drugs are made, by the formulations, the methods of treatment, that sort of thing. These are all things that form a penumbra around the API. And you know they're easier to design around because you have biosimilarity, as Emily said. And so you basically, what you want to do is have patents of varying scope. All the things the patent lawyers know to do is you have different patents, like the Russian doll, the nested Russian doll idea that you have. And you look at any pharmaceutical, you have a broad generic class with some funny chicken wire kind of structure and X's and Y's and R's and stuff. But what they actually are protecting their drug with at the end of the day is very specific. It reads right on their drug. Well, that's what, that's what we do. On top of that, because of the complexity of biotechnology patents, you get much more likely that you're going to get a restriction requirement because the examiners reasonably have only a small number of hours, relatively speaking, to examine. And if you have, you know, you don't get 20 claims in a biotech patent. You get maybe 100. And so, of course, they're going to, and, and they're to the methods of making, they're to the drug itself, they're to all sorts of variations, maybe things that have been modified, that sort of thing. So the, the patent office does this. And on top of that, if you were familiar with the SELECT case, you now have basically the Federal Circuit saying that because the public's right to have a date certain when a patent will expire uh, means that even if you have something that has gotten PTA, a continuation of example, or even not a division, but continuation, gets PTA, it's not entitled to that PTA. Because if, it's, if, it is a, if it is an obvious variant, then it should expire at the same time that the main patent expires. So what will happen? You'll have people trying to make get get restriction requirements, get things that what the patent office has said these are patently distinct, and therefore you'll be able to get more patents to protect that that franchise. And so it's going to get worse instead of better. Okay, I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to talk about the Mayor of Baltimore case. This was a class action on a novel this antitrust is theory. Materials. Yeah. Okay, and it was on Umera. Umera is the poster child for patent thickets because I think they have you know. 247 additional patent applications were filed that resulted in 132 patents. And the last one of these expired in 2034. Well, let's just talk about that, forgetting everything the patents say. The fact is that Yamara has been on the market a long time. And its original patent, I think, expired maybe in 2016. So now you have 18 more years of patents. And according to the the, the IPRs on all these, of course, and uh, the, the, the district court said you have a 534 batting average, better than Ty Cobb. Um, and there were 13 that were not instituted, five were instituted, and three were found invalid, and two were withdrawn by AbbVie. So you have 13 didn't even get past the institution stage. Right? And the thing that really annoys people is there was a very broad um, settlement agreement between the EU and the U.S. The EU entry was October of 2018. The U.S. was January of 2023. So why did the Europeans get in earlier? Well, some of the things Emily said. There are reasons why the scope of protection, the way that the, the EU system is set up, the fact that they have you know, national health services there that control drug costs to a certain extent more than we do, all sorts of reasons that that, it, that was how it turned out. But in fact, there's a lot of the drugs, the Umera now biosimilars, are entering the, I think one entered in July. A lot of people are now entering the market, not just getting approval, but entering the market. So that should at least disperse a little bit. Uh, the district court said, and here's a, here's a, uh, just, uh, you can read it, but this wasn't an antitrust case. This wasn't a situation where AbbVie really do, it did anything unlawful under the antitrust laws. And I think part of the reason that it was, it was, um, Brought was because that was the only, you know, when you have a hammer, every problem's a nail. That's pretty much how they thought they could get a broad decision on this. And a lot of it was Norr Pennington. The fact this was just, the fact that Abby filed a patent application, they, that's protected for antitrust, unless it was, you know, fraud on the patent office, but there was no allegation of that. And the Seventh Circuit affirmed that it was really Judge Easterbrook who basically said, what's wrong with having a lot of patents, which I think every patent lawyer kind of loved. And this was what Emily was referring to. The high-tech industry has a lot more. I think it was in the, in the Samsung, Apple, smartphone war. I mean, it was, maybe it was the New York Times, maybe it was the Wall Street Journal. But they had a phone, and they had literally arrows of all the patents that protected this. And you could barely read the print. It was so small because there were hundreds of patents protecting a smartphone. 
seems to me that you know drugs are a lot more important than smartphones, but that's just me because I have gray hair. Um, I think that what we have to face, whether we like it or not, is that you know you have to kind of rebut this patents are the problem, patents are the reasons that drugs cost too much, kind of a meme. And the problem with that is that you fail the cocktail party test almost immediately. You think of yourself discussing patent law, drug regulation, and molecular biology, and how long will it take you to be standing by yourself? Okay, not it, it's going to happen really quickly. And the problem is the other side are sound bites. Okay, and to go back to Marriott, get your hands off my jeans kind of thing. And I tried to tell people, I don't want your jeans. You probably have mutations I want nothing to do with. But the fact remains that, that we're in a, a, the, the, the op opposition, and I feel comfortable saying that, are people with really simple uh, means, simple arguments to make. And frankly, this is an area where experts, like we are supposed to be, people aren't listening to. Right? Think about poor Dr. Fauci, you know, guy with 30, 40 years of, of public service, and he's the devil if you go on LinkedIn. Of course, why there's on LinkedIn, I'll never know. But the fact remains, we're in that, okay? And the other thing to keep in mind is that most of these drugs are diseases of aging, right? These are drugs to things like cancer and, and things that people get when they're older. And so I think there's a certain amount of, it's a double-edged sword, but the, the meme that I would make, the counter-argument I would make is, look, think about the benefits of these drugs. I mean, my father died when he was 40 of cancer, okay? And I regret that. But the fact is, is that if you had somebody who, if he'd lived till 65, besides helping me grow up, 25 years of being a productive citizen, 25 more years of paying taxes, okay? 25 years of doing things that, that we want people to get old enough to actually contribute because when you're 40, as much as I regret saying it, you're not necessarily at the prime of knowing what you're doing. But that last 25 years of your life, you're probably the most productive citizen you can be. And then you have the social stuff. You know, you get to walk your daughter down the aisle, all that sort of stuff. But let's be hard-headed economists and say, it's good for the country as a whole for us to have drugs that help people live longer. And the fact that some company for 20 years makes a little bit of money shouldn't be the reason why we decide that it's not important. So... I think that that's kind of the, the, the fight that we're in, and I do think it's a fight because it's so much easier to convince a 25-year-old Hill staffer that that simple argument is what they should listen to and tell their boss as opposed to having their eyes glaze over, and Hans will tell you all about that, and I'm trying to tell people what reality really is. So that's what I have to say, and thank you very much thank for listening. Thank you very much. In your materials also, I have provided a site um, to a Federal Trade Commission economic study that was done some years ago that t determined that uh, patent thickets were not a problem in the pharmaceutical industry. And this administration took that document down from the FTC's web page. But you do have a cop, you do have a site where you could find it if you want it. That should tell you something, doesn't it? Okay. With that, should Dr. I just go? Dr. Sauer is, is the man of the hour. How do you like that? And he is um, bad shape, the yeah. Deputy General Counsel and Vice President of Intellectual Property for Bio. It's a tr the largest trade association representing over 1,000 biotechnology companies in medical agriculture, environment, and industrial sectors. And he is a personal favored friend of mine because he can take difficult things and explain them in plain English. Yeah, as if that would do a lot of good. So, yeah, I work for a trade <laughs> association, right? Most of the companies I work for are run by scientists. And uh, so I have a theory about this. The uh, scientists, that includes commercial scientists, think that, oh, you know, we look at these policy debates and, you know, if only policymakers had access to the best and most reliable information, then they would make wise decisions, right? The question only becomes a matter of giving the correct information. It becomes a question of education. Then wise policy will follow, right? And it's hard, like, to, to talk to business leaders in that context because in other industries, like, people often don't think quite that way. I saw, I, I do think... Um, in biotech and the life sciences, sometimes we walk into our own traps when we try to, to advocate for positions coming from such a data-driven empirical approach. Nonetheless, what part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and take us a bit circle. We talked about the narratives, supposed patent tickets, there are too many patents. 
and the like. Uh, and I'll show you some data about because all of this should be amenable to empirical study, right? When we say, oh, patents, there are too many patents on drugs, we can actually go and count, right? How many are we talking about when we say too many? What is that, right? Is there something unusual going on in the pharma space with respect to its patenting practices that sets it apart from other industries? I talk to many policymakers who are genuinely surprised. Why would it be that there's maybe more than one patent on a drug? And, and then I tell them, well, that's not a, that uncommon. I can show you golf balls that have 50 patents on them. Uh, pick any product, right? There are, there are earplugs that have eight patents on them. So that in itself is not that unusual. There's nothing weird about drugs that have more than one patent on them, nonetheless. Right, so we're going to, to talk a bit about um, uh, how this manifests, what we know about how many patents there actually are. Right, this has been well studied in the Orange Book. So I'll show it to you and, and we'll see what we make of it. Right, and I will not try and convince you of something. I'll just try and ground us for purposes of discussion. So typical narratives, you all heard it. Right, pharma companies um, use patents to somehow extend something beyond the time contemplated by law or what policy thinks is right. They extend something, monopolies, is most often said. They extend their monopolies or, or, or extend their market share or extend you know, some other position in the market, extend a product, extend something. And, and uh, what exactly it is that supposedly extended changes, but I want you to keep this in mind because all these narratives around patents are built around the notion of they cause delay. Right? They cause later entry of uh, uh, unpatented, cheap, competing, generic, or biosimilar products. Uh, these delays are getting longer. They're costing taxpayers and consumers in terms of money and years of life. Uh, so extend is the operative term. Whenever we talk about patent thickets, it's usually with the goal of showing that uh, there's everlasting market life, evergreening is a term you've probably heard, right, which was coined around these ideas. Okay, so so what are we talking about? Right, to so many patents. When there's more than one patent on a drug, what do these patents claim? Yes, many drugs, in fact, probably most that go to market, um, have a patent on the active ingredient. The molecule that makes the drug work is often patented, but not always. Um, you might be surprised to know that one third of all new drugs, even new molecules that go to uh, that are approved by the FDA, one third of them don't actually have patents on the active ingredient. Right? The first HIV drugs, for example, this is taught in law school, uh, was like a groundbreaking drug uh, where the molecule was actually invented in the 60s. Right? It was invented for a different purpose. It never worked. So the drug itself was already known. Its usefulness in treating another disease was not understood. At any rate, this is how this can happen. Lots of drugs actually get approved by the FDA, and they don't have a patent on the active molecule. So if they don't have that, uh, what other patents may be there for small molecule drugs? I'm going to focus on those because those have been studied most uh, in depth and for <coughs> the longest time. So other patents claim uh, special formulation needs, right? Not all pills are suitable for the same patients. We might have segments of, say, the elderly, right? Uh, there's a famous drug, Namenda, an Alzheimer's drug, which first went to market in a tablet form, right? and later the, the manufacturer like, did realize that for, for patients who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, a tablet that needs to be taken three or four times a day may not be ideal. So they introduced a patch formulation, which really made a big difference, right? Special formulation needs is a typical area of, of add-on innovation, cumulative innovation, that if it's patentable, why shouldn't it be patented? Use of special salts, hydrates, special forms of the molecule, methods of administration, special patient populations, stratified precision medicine applications, and also an important area of drug delivery technology, so applicators, right? Uh, 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 meter dose inhalers, injection pens. If you don't want to leave your diabetic grandmother alone at home with a vial of insulin and a syringe, what well, maybe an auto-injector pen, what right, is a much better and safer solution. These pens, they, uh, they meter the dose, they count the doses, 
Uh, they have protective features built in against overdosing. So what? There's a lot of technology like in other technologies that can be packed into a drug. And I would actually uh, propose to you that as drug delivery technology and as drugs become more complex, right, we will see more of these debates because more technology will need to be stacked into drug products. And that will, of course, come like it does in other technologies with additional patents for which innovators want to be uh, compensated, right? But anyway, how many patents are we typically talking? Well, three to five patents listed in the orange book. That's uh, for, for small molecules. That's about a typical measure. If you look at these, what some people call secondary patents, and you ask, well, when do, when do these secondary patents expire relative to the original patent on the drug molecule? Right? We're going back to this notion of, oh, there's extension of monopolies going on. When do these later patents expire? They do expire later, right? They expire on average four and a half to five years after the patent on the molecule itself. Right? And that may not be so surprising because these subsequent inventions are often made during drug development. Right? So they're invented later, and if they're patented, they expire later. Um, that's just the way it is, like in any industry, if you start stacking technology into a product that keeps developing and evolving. Um, so um, it is, it's often said right, that especially these later expiring patents, these secondary patents, these, these look like new patents on old drugs. This is often repeated. Right? Many of you may have heard this if you follow public discourse in this space. So, so companies get new patents on, on old drugs. Uh, that, too, can be studied, right? If you look at the patents that cover a drug listed in the Orange Book, you can look at when were they filed, when were they granted, right? Are they really new? How new are they relative to the original patent? Um, and this was studied, you know, more than a decade ago for, and, and even before. So you look at, uh, I'm, sh I'm showing you right here, right? Patents on the compound itself were almost always filed before the drug was approved by the FDA. Of course, that makes sense, right? And they were almost always issued also at the time the FDA approved the new drug application. So you had a live patent at the time your drug got approved that claims the molecule itself. What about these other patents, these new patents on old drugs that we complain about, patents on like the formulations, right, or special uses? And when you look at those, when they were filed, right, and when they were granted, you would see that overwhelmingly they were also already on file in the patent office in the process of being examined at the time the drug was approved at the FDA. Right? So they're not actually like really new patents. They're just patents that hadn't yet been issued by the patent office, but they were part of the original package of IP that existed when the drug was approved. Right? Um, no, the fact that half of these patents issue sometimes after the drug was already approved, you all know how long it can take for a patent application to pend in the patent office. Well, it can take much more than three years. So when people say companies get new patents on old drugs, what overwhelmingly they mean is patents that hadn't been issued at the time the drug was already approved, but overwhelmingly they were already pending. So they're not all that new. Right? They were already like in existence notionally at the time the drug was approved. Susan, how many minutes would you give me? I'd give you uh, 45 seconds. 45 seconds? So I know somebody in the audience wants to ask you a question. Yeah. Okay, so let me blow right through this. Right? So how many patents are we talking about? Well, a typical number of <coughs> patents for a small molecule drug. This two has been studied. A typical number is actually two. Right? Two patents in the orange book. Not 50, not 100. Right? And you find you know, a fair number of new drugs that have four, five, six, or seven uh, patents uh, listed in the orange book. But more than that is really rare. So when people say patent thickets, what they're really talking about is a body typically of four to six patents, right? a thicket of five. Um, and how thick is that? I don't know. Uh, it's changed <laughs> over time. Uh, what, it's true that over the years, innovator companies have had a tendency to list more patents. It's gone from around two to three to currently around between four and six patents in the orange book. Right? So there's, there has been a change 
over the years, but it's not something I think that would, would knock us off our feet. Now, let me see which is the last point I will make. Um, nominal patent term, when you look at the latest to expire patent that's listed for a drug in the orange book, what that, that latest expiration date of the latest to expire patent is not a measure or market exclusivity. And that maybe gets me back to what I said earlier. The narratives around thickets are all built around the notion of these patents extend the monopoly out for a really very long time. Now, in reality, when we look at, well, how do drugs fare that have very long residual patent life, you know, for something that they've listed in the orange book, when do generics actually enter the market when you look at these drugs? And you will see that actual generic market entry and nominal patent life, they don't correlate very well. In fact, they don't correlate at all. Nominal latest to expire patent life is not actually a measure of actual market exclusivity for, for new chemical entity drugs. And this maybe is where I'll stop, Susan, right? When one setting aside patents now, let's forget about patents. Right, because this debate isn't really about patents, it's about notional ever-extended monopolies. That too is actually amenable to empirical study. You can take new drugs that are approved by the FDA, innovator drugs, and you can count the days until a generic enters the market. Right? That's the period they had for their exclusivity. And we don't know how that came to pass, but if it's true that patents uh, cause ever-extending monopolies and that the practice is getting worse, we should be able to see it when we just look at when are new drugs approved and when do they get generic competition. That's been studied for over 30 years. Right? And uh, it would surprise many people who haven't been following this that it's been stable for over 30 years too. What is, if somebody asks you, what is the average, if you will, monopoly life of a new drug well, there's an answer. The answer is around 13 and a half years. Right? And then, typically, generics will enter. Right? And the reasons could be manifold. However, you know, it is uh, responsive to, uh, uh, to these accounts that say companies accumulate patents. Now we know how many they actually do accumulate. Right? That's been studied. Um, uh, we know that patent life doesn't correlate with market life, and we actually know the market life, and it's been stable at 13 and a half years. People are, of course, free to say, 13 and a half years, okay, that was always too long. <coughs> right? And that's, you know, if somebody wants to say that as a normative matter, that's fine. We can have that debate. At least we have an informed debate of how long market life is and how long it's always been. Right? But what we don't see is a correlation between the numbers of patents or even what these patents claim and how long patents have exclusive life in the marketplace. Thank you. Or ultimately, what if innovator companies are trying to create patent thickets to extend their monopolies, they're not doing a very good job. <laughs> You're inept at it. Yeah. So if they don't extend market exclusivity, what do these patents do? It's for another discussion. We have ideas about that as well. But I hope maybe this helped inform further debate. It was fabulous. Thank you very much, Hans. You know, I often think that part of the problem we have is, is basically with language and the difference you know, with different um, segments of law. Um, I began my life as an antitrust lawyer, and a monopoly means something in antitrust law. Patent, it, all a patent is is a right to exclude someone for a limited time period. It has nothing to do with a monopoly. Um, and, and Hans, don't use that word anymore. That's the wrong word to use. I know other people do it, but don't do it because it, it perpetuates the thought that patents are a monopoly. They are not. They're, it's a property right. I'm with you, and I was partly facetious, partly falling into the trap of adopting other states. You did. Like, okay. Just like the very fact that we're talking about so-called patent thickets is we're already using the epithet. That's I know Tom epithet. Stoll has a, has a question for you. Tom, you yeah, wanted to talk to Hans. This is your chance. Get up here. Hustle it up quickly. Hans doesn't answer my phone. <laughs> 
So if we uh, uh, adopt solutions that have been proposed to address patent thicketing, and one of the ones I've seen on the Hill is you get to assert one patent and only one child patent, uh, what would companies do to address that? It, you know, we haven't really had that conversation internally, and I was just, just wondering what your thought, what sort of nefarious conduct would they be forced into doing? Would we see thicket solutions pushing companies towards evergreening? Well, was it directed at the, the whole panel? I would, oh, yeah, what nefarious activity. Um, I, th I think in the first instance, the nefarious activity might be on the side of the putative infringer, right? So let's take biologics, right, where there's, you know, a good technology stack. And uh, so a biosimilar might come in and say, well, okay, so we want to copy the molecule. We also want to copy, like, all the different ways it can be used. We want to copy the applicator, you know, which makes it safe and effective for important patient formulations. And then we want to use a resin for protein purification during manufacturing. Well, we want to do all that. We basically want to use 20 different inventions in making a drug. And let's imagine we had a law that says innovators can only assert one patent. Well, innovators, of course, would be in a terrible position to have to decide, well, which of my 20 inventions am I going to try to protect what, that they're using? Uh, and likewise, on the, I think on the biosimilar side, my first strategy might be, how can I force, uh, is there a way to guide the litigation in a way for where the innovator can maybe assert a, the one patent that they're asserting against me? Um, how do I put this? Right? And, and in the meantime, I get away with infringing patents on 15 other inventions. So to steer where that would go through the use of post-grant proceedings, mm -hmm. which are in fact being used a lot actually by biosimilars, right? It's a more active space challenging biologics patents in the PTAP, right? Is actually more common than challenging small molecule patents in the PTAP by generic drug companies. They don't do that very much anymore. Um, so what I think the first if you were nefarious activities, I would see it would be through gaming and strategic actions in the PTAP long in advance of a biosimilar application being even submitted. Right. Um, Kevin, do you have thoughts on yeah, this? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's kind of where we are with the, with the patent dance. Okay, right? Just de facto, you don't get people asserting 15 patents uh, in a patent dance. They have to choose. And the minimum is one, and maybe there's two. But so I think there's a little bit of that already, although you actually you can have serial rounds of this. But I think that what history will show us is that, and has showed us, is that you do that, the parties stake out their positions, and they settle. And it's just, when does the generic come, with biosimilar come on the market? And that's what happened with Humira. Humira technically could have pushed it to 2034, perhaps, depending upon if, those, if the, all those patents would cover it. But between the politics and everything else, they settled to 2023. And I think that that's where the economists come in, and they say, OK, how much money can you make? And remember, it's not the race to the bottom. It's not the 10 cents per pill that you have for a small molecule. So, and, this, and what the, the slide I didn't go over was a case of disparagement, where <clears throat> what the biosimilar was saying is that there was an ad that was put out in the back, I think it was the back cover of a, a pharmaceutical magazine, uh, journal, and it basically said, you don't want to use the, the biosimilar because they're not us, and you've had all this experience with us, and because of the similarity aspect, there's a certain amount of, of attraction that you get with doctors because a doctor has a sick patient with a complicated, usually life-threatening disease that has a drug that works, right? And to make a biosimilar, which by definition isn't identical, raises the possibility that maybe it won't work exactly the same way. And that can be quantitative in the fact that it doesn't treat it as well, which is qualitative. A lot of these drugs have side effects, you know, which may be things like nausea or just you know, unpleasant feeling. Well, what if this is worse or different? And again, and these tend to be older people. And you know, I can tell you, us old people don't like stuff to be changed, especially when it's our medicines. So I think there's a lot of, of that uh, resistance to biosimilars. And so I think, that, I think that that is, there's lots of ways you can skin the cat. Professor Keith had a comment. I'm sure he does. Go ahead. <laughs> Look, I, I'm just astounded that we are actually 
making a choice to engage in a conversation about an optimum size or an optimum number where we are so convinced that three and a half is a thicket and three and a quarter is awesome, or 7.25 is utterly horrible, but 7.16 is, oh, nirvana. Like, that's just, there's nothing in life, nothing in a biological system, nothing in a human system that works that way. We can tune digital systems to work that way, but that's also a choice. And you make that choice for very specific reasons in a digital system. But you would never make that choice in a legal system like this. Uh, the, the, the notion that there's a socially optimum right number of patents to be asserting in a particular time. And then even if we did make that choice, how, uh, do, are, you, are you so convinced that, that all the rest of the market actors observing that choice really haven't learned anything else in law school other than to maximize the optimization of the choice you just taught them? Because I think they're also learning corporate law and other areas of law. And so, you know, they will simply Wolkowski taxi cab. You know, if, if the right way to run the taxi business is 10 corporations each owning five taxi cabs, then that's how they'll structure the business to make money. Now, uh, you, why do we, why do we want to shunt the ownership structure of patents uh, into a aggregated or disaggregated outcome simply because we think there is some market problem associated with something, I, I guess, called a thicket. What is a thicket? Don't know. We've had that discussion. I guess called notice. What is notice? I don't know. Patent law has all of these statutory rules about notice, right? Section 112, written description, enablement, best mode, definiteness. We have four separate doctrines we've already, we're very creative people in patent law, we've already worked into the system to make sure that a potential user or a potential trespasser can tell what the boundaries are. But, but just one last point, almost every one of these big cases are willfulness cases. And I don't know what I'm surprised means if it includes my lawyer said it would happen. And my lawyer said it would happen is what makes me a willful infringer. So these are actual cases getting adjudicated where people are saying, I'm surprised that, there were, that I'm an infringer, but I'm also willful because my lawyer said I'd be an infringer. That's a very capacious definition of I'm surprised. Um, Professor Morris? So, Tom, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking how the innovator companies will actually react if we do a, a one-and-done type of system. Um, I'm not sure I can predict how they would react, but I'm worried that they would react by greatly contracting um, the range of different um, uh, pharmaceuticals that they're willing to invest in. Um, and we've already heard uh, accusations that, oh, the pharmaceutical companies, they're so profit-driven. They're only focusing on the chronic diseases. They're only focusing on um, the cash cows. They're only focusing on, you know, the lifestyle drugs. They're not focusing on the neglected diseases. They're not focusing on antibiotics and um, uh vaccines and things like that. And I think that would just be greatly exacerbated. Um, and so if we had a one and done system, I don't think that the, the um, public view of the pharmaceutical industry would improve. It would just shift the criticisms, right? It would just shift and say, well, um, you know, they're only, they're only looking for, for what's going to be most profitable for them and not what's best for society. Um, and I think there's this general perception um, that you know, of all the industries, right, the pharmaceutical industry is a, a commercial industry, but of all the industries, that's the one that has the biggest social responsibility. And so we criticize them for acting the same way we would any other commercial actor. And I think that's, that's kind of what um, Scott is saying as well. Do we have any other questions from the audience? We have just a few minutes. All right, if there are none, um, we have, uh, uh, you have some homework to do for me. There is a survey form. We want that excellent check off for our group here. <laughs> That's a commercial. Um, and I, let me just give you some, uh, one quick closing thought. 
I was in the car going home last night. I, I was so tired uh, from the day that I didn't go to the dinner, and I was listening to the news, which was even more depressing between what's going on in the house and the fights in Israel and the fighting in Ukraine. And I'm sitting here thinking, and we're up here worried about patent thickets <laughs> uh, or other types of things. And uh, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower said one time, if you can't solve the problem, enlarge the context. Rumsfeld, I think, adopted that as his own, but it wasn't, it was from Eisenhower. And I was thinking about that because when I go to these conferences, I wind up leaving being very depressed because I don't see, you know, we all talk to each other and, you know, we're all excited about all these things, but no one really gives a you-know-what outside of this room very much. If you walk down the street and ask somebody, what do you think about patent thickets, they will wonder what type of street drugs you're taking. Um, but we have to talk about this in the sense of what do we want in this country? We want a democracy. In order to have a democracy, you have to have people that are fed, not fighting on the streets, and have a stake in the system. And the stake in the system has always been property rights. People will fight for what they own, which is theirs. And so what we need to do is reframe all of this discussion in terms of what we're really fighting about is Without property rights, capital will not be invested. And without that, there will not be jobs. And without any of those things, we will lose our democracy. That's really what we're, what we're fighting for in this conference, our democracy. Enjoy your lunch. The speakers are available for you. Thank you. Well done. And fill out your forms. Well done.